Prime Minister who told MPs earlier today, I am a fighter, not a quitter but hours later was forced to reshuffle her cabinet again. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in the Houses of Parliament. Gary. Well, Suella Braverman's resignation is an extraordinary moment, not just because she's gone, but who has replaced her. Grant Schatz was someone who was going around this building as recently as this morning, uh, telling people that he was a candidate to succeed uh, um, uh, Liz, Liz Truss and that he was quite clearly in most people's eyes plotting to bring her down. What is happening in front of our eyes at the moment, uh, one Tory MP just uh, said it had struck him, is a Rishi Sunak government is forming around Liz Truss uh, as if she wasn't even there. Uh, on the reasons for Suella Braverman's uh, resignation, well, uh, there clearly was a row going on behind about uh, the scenes about policy. Suella Braverman thought the Prime Minister was relaxing uh, immigration controls too much. The Prime Minister was doing it in order to get growth uh, figures I improved. Uh, but and, and Suella Braverman is kind of implying in her letter of resignation that uh, this was a technical matter that she was uh, actually uh, found fault with in the end. Her supporters, uh, people who, who wanted her to win the leadership, are now beginning to think that they may be. Having given Liz Truss a good reception last night at the, the ERG uh, reception, a group that she belongs to and used to run, they're now beginning maybe they, to think they should be trying to bring Liz Truss down. All this on a day when Liz Truss had to suspend one of her aides because he had allegedly made a, a remark about a former cabinet minister suggesting his career in government was excremental. While they're now, uh, tonight, having a vote on fracking, which uh, Tory backbenchers are, are going to defy an order to back the government on, and which the government is currently flopping around in all directions, not sure whether it's a vote of no confidence at all. And on top of it all, we had a U-turn on a U-turn today. Yesterday told that the budget uh, would consider uh, conceivably cutting uh, pensions, not implementing uh, the triple lock, cutting them back from the top increase they should have under the triple lock. Today we're told that won't happen at all. A day of absolute chaos and a lot of people who are waiting, wondering whether to press the button before they knew what would actually follow Liz Truss. A lot of Tory MPs tonight saying actually they're going to hit the button maybe as soon as tonight, even though they can't be sure who succeeds her. The Home Secretary resigned after this morning sending an official government document on her personal email to an MP ally. In her resignation letter, Suella Braverman said she realised her mistake and reported herself to the Cabinet Secretary for technically infringing the rules. The Prime Minister decided it was a breach of the ministerial code. In her resignation letter, the former leadership rival of Liz Truss's pointedly compared her own behaviour with that of the Prime Minister's writing, pretending we haven't made mistakes, carrying on as if everyone can't see that we have made them, and hoping that things will magically come right is not serious politics. I have made a mistake. I accept responsibility. I resign. Suella Braverman goes on to attack Liz Truss's government, saying she has concerns about the direction of this government, and specifically serious concerns about this government's commitment to honouring manifesto commitments such as reducing overall migration numbers and stopping illegal migration. The new Home Secretary is Grant Shapps, walking up Downing Street only six weeks after Liz Truss sacked him as Transport Secretary. He's widely seen as a central figure, plotting Liz Truss's downfall, who sees himself as a contender to succeed the Prime Minister. I would love to be having a, a front page of the Telegraph yeah. with a, fly, a plane taking off to Rwanda. That's my dream. Suella Braverman at the Tory conference two weeks ago. Since then, she's been battling with the Prime Minister behind the scenes, trying to stop Liz Truss relaxing immigration controls We've to boost this. growth forecasts in the budget at the end of this month. Suella Braverman's allies on the right of the party tonight are muttering about a stitch-up, claiming centrists who voted Remain are taking back the top Tory jobs. Some on the right say their support for Liz Truss's premiership could now end. All this only hours after Liz Truss, at only her third Prime Minister's questions, tried to draw a line under the giant errors of her brief premiership. I have been very clear that I am... Mr Speaker... I'm sorry, and that I have made mistakes. But the right thing to do in those circumstances is to 
make changes, which I have made, and to get on with the job. A book is being written about the Prime Minister's time in office. <laughs> Apparently, it's going to be out by Christmas. Is that the release date or the title? <laughs> just under two months, and I have delivered the energy price guarantee. The Labour leader said the country had got nothing positive out of her short-lived economic experiment. I've got the list here. 45p tax cut, gone. Corporation tax cut, gone. 20p tax cut, gone. Two-year energy freeze, gone. Tax-free shopping, gone. Economic credibility, gone. And her supposed best friend, the former Chancellor, he's gone as well. They're all gone. So why is she still here? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. While she was in the chamber, it was announced that the Prime Minister had suspended a senior aide, Jason Stein under pressure from the former Tory Chancellor, Sajid Javid, who believes Mr Stein briefed insults about him to the Sunday Times. All this on the day official data showed inflation is running at 10.1%, with some food prices up by more than 20%. But the government announced the state pension would get an inflation-proofed rise, only one day after Number 10 insisted it could be a victim of spending cuts. We have been clear in our manifesto that we will maintain the triple lock, and I am completely committed to it. So is the Chancellor. It was suggested the Prime Minister told the Chancellor she wanted all speculation shut down on the pension triple lock. But tonight, her authority is being flaunted on yet another front. Tory MPs were told to vote against a ban on fracking, even though the Tory manifesto called for a ban. At least four Tory MPs said they would defy that instruction and could lose the party whip. They should take a look at the faces of colleagues behind them, colleagues who have fracking sites in their constituencies, and they should hang their heads in shame. In the last few minutes, the new Home Secretary has arrived at his new department. I mean, look, I accept that the government has obviously had a very difficult um, period. As Jeremy Hunt said, uh, when he was appointed on, on Friday, uh, that nonetheless means it's doubly important to ensure that we are doing absolutely everything to in, in the basic uh, areas. And Jeremy Hunt, I think, has done a, a great job of um, you know, settling uh, the, the issues relating to that uh, mini-budget. The new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, got two name checks. There was no mention of Liz Truss. A new government is taking shape around her before she's even left office. Gary Gibbon, well, a short time ago, I spoke to the Conservative Minister, Steve Baker, and I asked him, what's been going on? Well, today with Suella Bravman, it's very straightforward. Suella made a mistake today. She sent a document using her personal email that she should not have done. She's accepted responsibility for that and tendered her resignation, and uh, she's right to do so. I think it shows great integrity. But, had but it's she not... not... Sorry, go on. Had she not made that mistake, I'm absolutely certain she would have continued as Home Secretary. Well, are you sure about that? Because in her resignation letter, she takes clear pot shots at Liz Truss and the direction the government has taken in the last few days, which is obviously in opposition to everything she has stood for. She opposed the U-turn on 45p tax. She's worried about the imminent immigration announcement. This is an excuse, isn't it? Uh, no, I've seen Suella in the course of today. I've been with her for quite a while, and I know that she would certainly have continued in the government uh, if it was not for this mistake uh, today over email and a document. But, you know, tensions are bound to emerge at times of resignation and, uh, you know, it's perfectly natural. I'm not concerned about it. In fact, I very much hope and uh, I hope that the Prime Minister will be able to reappoint Suella in the new year. So the, the, the proposition is that this was a matter of competence. The Home Secretary made a security breach by releasing sensitive information on her personal email. I mean, this is another example of 
incompetence by this government, isn't it? Well, no. So mem ministers routinely consult members of parliament on policy and to do parliamentary handling on how policies will land. And what Suella did was put a draft written ministerial statement, in other words, a document that was due to be published tomorrow. She put that to a trusted uh, colleague and to ask his advice. And the only reason it was official sensitive was because it was not yet released. Right, but voters are going to look at this and they're going to say, your budget has caused chaos and pain and has cost us all lots of money, the whole country. You've U-turned on it. You've sacked the Chancellor. You've brought in Jeremy Hunt. The Home Secretary's resigned. Now you've brought in Jeremy uh, Grant Shapps. And tonight you are facing a rebellion of your own backbench MPs who have been told they are voting on a matter of confidence and will lose the party whip. This government is looking like a joke. Well, I'm not going to pretend for a moment that these are not tumultuous times, but if I may, on the issue tonight, this is a moment when Conservative MPs are potentially voting to hand control to the Labour Party of the House of Commons. That is a matter of confidence, whether the issue was fracking or anything else. Steve Baker talking to me before we came on air. Let's get some breaking news now from Gary, who's in the Commons. What's happening? The Chief Whip's resigned. You, you couldn't make this up. The, in the middle of the, uh, at the very end of the vote uh, just now on fracking, uh, it appears what turned uh, uh, Wendy Morton uh, made to decide to uh, resign was the fact that she and her whips had issued an instruction this morning saying anybody who, vote, who votes uh, against uh, fracking coming back or who votes for a fracking ban uh, they would be uh, effectively uh, voting no confidence in the government and would lose the whip. In the last moments of the debate, a government minister got up, presumably on instructions uh, from number 10, and said, oh, no, it's not a confidence uh, vote, this. And I think Wendy Morton, the chief whip, felt that her, uh, her entire credibility was uh, on the line, and she's walked. Uh, this has not been confirmed yet, I should say, uh, but several Tory MPs come running, running out of the lobby saying that is what had uh, happened. And we were saying a, a little while ago that it feels like Tory MPs are going to take matters into their hands, into their letter-writing skills, uh, write letters uh, to the chairman of the 1922 committee uh, saying they have no confidence uh, in the prime minister. And if you get enough of those letters, a great big bulk of them, 50% of the uh, MPs, really not inconceivable at the moment, saying they have no confidence in the prime minister, that might uh, open up the whole possibility of uh, ignoring the rules as they stand at the moment, which say you've got to wait a whole year for a no-confidence vote, and in effect just getting rid of the uh, Prime Minister, telling her, well, look, there's so many people here who don't approve of you, we've got to uh, move to a ballot, and we've probably got to move to a speeded-up ballot, uh, which doesn't include the members and just includes MPs. So, Gary, this vote that is going on right now, which we're going to get the result in the next few minutes, it's, but it's not one of those where there's any danger of the government actually losing the vote, is it? It's just no. that there have been Conservative rebels. There, there isn't a danger of the government losing the vote because uh, MPs were told it was a vote of no confidence and they couldn't vote with uh, as many of them wanted to on this. Quite a few of them have fracking issues in their constituencies. They wanted to vote against the government, but they were, they were browbeaten into not doing that, told it was a vote of no confidence. The very last minute, uh, uh, the government minister stands up and says, well, actually, uh, this isn't a vote of no confidence. But I don't think the message got around quick enough uh, for the numbers to be actually threatening the government. And anyway, a government minister got up and said it wasn't a matter of no confidence. So uh, it, 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 it isn't. And you would, think, well, you would think it isn't. I'm not sure what ground I stand on on any of this any, anymore. It doesn't feel very firm. But you would think that those people who are abstaining tonight on this vote, Tory MPs who are rebelling by abstaining, that they will not lose the whip. And frankly, there isn't, a, by the look of it, a chief whip there to remove it from them. Right. Um, and, and so where do you think that leaves us in terms of whether MPs will be putting in more letters tonight and yeah, whether I... Graham Brady will be going to see the Prime Minister tonight, tomorrow morning, when? I think we're in that sort of zone. Uh, all the MPs I spoke to while I was running around to tell you about this, all of them were saying, this is it, this is enough. A few of them were saying it when Suella Breverman uh, went. And they, uh, it, the, but the problem for these MPs, whichever wing of the party they're in, is that there is no agreed succession. Uh, maybe if they do press the button in the next 24, 48 hours and put in enough letters and they tell uh, Liz Truss she's got to go, uh, maybe it will focus minds and there could be an agreed succession. But that has not been the mood of Tory MPs I've been sp speaking to today. It felt very much more that uh, 
that was still up for grabs. Rishi Sunak doesn't want to budge. He's, he's, certainly his people feel he, he's, the, he's the right man for the job right now. Penny Mordaunt is saying she has a claim on it. And, and, and there are MPs. Again, I met three uh, in, in the last five minutes who walked up to me and said, time for Boris Johnson. Right. So, I mean, it's, it really sounds like events have overtaken any attempt to make this a sort of an orderly transfer. I mean, there is no unity candidate, is there? No, exactly. There was a strong sense that that was what Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922, and quite a lot of other uh, senior backbenchers were hoping to finesse, and maybe if you left it till uh, Jeremy Hunt's budget was out of the way, October 31st, uh, you could... You could, you could maybe do it some time after that when the time felt right and when, you, uh, uh, when everyone had moved to some sort of consensus. But the consensus isn't a, bit, a word you hear a lot of in the Tory party at the moment. And un unity, likewise, not a lot of that word either. And it looks as though, if you were guessing right now, and as I say, I'm not sure of anything in this uh, particular world uh, in, anymore, it looks as though we are moving to the defenestration of another Tory party leader in quite short order. We'll be back to you shortly, Gary. Thank you for now. Uh, back in the real world, the soaring inflation figures fuelled by the price of food has piled even more worries onto people struggling with the cost of living crisis, from pensioners to hospitality businesses. Ah, sorry, uh, before we go to that piece, the result of that vote is coming now. Let's Eyes listen in. to the right, 230. The nose to the left, 326. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 230. The nose to the left, 326. So the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock. Uh, point, point of order. Okay, so as we said there, um, the, the government wins that vote, but the question will be how many Conservative MPs ended up abstaining or even voting with Labour, and we'll get those numbers and we'll bring them to you later in the programme. So, back to um, the item about the cost of living that I was just about to introduce. From pensioners to hospitality businesses, the rising costs and squeezes on incomes are already having a huge impact. Our policy correspondent, Paul McNamara, has been in the west of England, hearing concerns from people there. OK, we're going to take the toes and heels out. Midweek in Avonmouth is the dance and forgetting the day-to-day. -day. Every Wednesday you're wiggling. I'm wiggling, yeah. <laughs> but in a cost-of-living crisis, life outside of this class is no waltz. So aside from heating, are you cutting out on anything else? Uh, food. Inflation is at a four-decade high. The effect is being felt, and in particular, in one area of spending. That's basic sometimes, yeah. you know, the milk and milk. things like that. That's all gone up, you know. <coughs> and the thing is, you, you need for a cup of tea, you know. You, c you can't afford to make a cup of coffee if you need too much milk. A tin of baked beans has gone up by 4p, and when the tin that you buy is 21p, and it's gone up to 25, four piece, pretty steep. And for, not just for pensioners, but for young mums and families, baked beans is a staple of your diet. Luckily, I've got all my meat for Christmas because our local butcher told us that the price of turkeys was going up by 33%. Dance is followed by a cut price meal, but costs here too are soaring. In the last year, food has increased by 14.6%, up by the highest rate in 42 years. Inflation across the economy is now running at 10.1%, a 40-year high. Good numbers were hard to find today. Petrol had come down 8.7 pence on the month, but it's 30 pence more expensive than a year ago. And economists are expecting things to get worse. Inflation of 11% come April next year, when the government's energy price guarantee scheme expires. Prices aren't just rising for families, but businesses too. Covid looks like a teddy bear's picnic compared to what we're dealing with now. Joe owns four pubs around Bath and should be entering a busy Christmas period. We're finding that customers, their budgets are squeezed, they're going out, they're spending less, they're trying to tighten their belts. And at the same time, our costs have gone through the roof. You know, these aren't sort of small cost movements. They are massive cost movements. Anyone on their own could dramatically you know, reduce your profitability. At what point do you just stop making a profit? Well, I, you know, 
I hate to say that we're pretty much at that point right now. The inflation and cost of living double whammy will be bad enough for the economy by themselves, but timing has put rocket boosters on the damage done. Businesses are just out of COVID and lockdowns, where many of them racked up debts in the hope of making all that money back post-pandemic. Now, for a lot of firms, that's impossible, and it will have major consequences. Business West has been running a confidence index for 14 years. They say it's now at its lowest ever. For many businesses across our region, that concern is about how viable they are, whether they can continue. And lots of businesses are reporting to us that, that they're really, they're struggling with that decision about whether to persevere through this coming winter or whether to actually make that, that difficult decision to close part of their business now before they get into further debt. It's not just business, but people having a crisis of confidence though. With the government on rocky ground, even good news, a commitment to pensions triple lock is met with scepticism. That's got to be good news, right? Yes, of course it yeah. has. How long? So change it next week. Yeah, yeah. or tomorrow yeah. even. The economic winds are foreboding. Stability and certainty right now don't seem to appear on the horizon. So with inflation still rising and economic policy switching back towards austerity, where does this leave our economy? Our economics reporter, Neil MacDonald, is in the newsroom. So, first of all, how worrying is the food inflation? Well, food inflation is putting a big squeeze on people's incomes and it's probably coming as a very big shock to a lot of households. Uh, so as we saw in Paul's piece, food inflation is currently running at 14.6% a year. But if you go back to last summer, food inflation was nothing actually. Food prices were actually falling by 0.6%. And actually through a lot of the 2010s, food inflation has either been very low or actually negative. So many people will just not be used to this incredibly rapid increase in the price of some essentials. And the impact on households is also falling unequally. So across uh, all households in the UK, about 15% of their spending goes on food. But for those on the bottom 10% of incomes, it's more like 20%. And that is, of course, because people with less money tend to spend more of that money on the essentials. Are we at the peak? Well, no, not quite, but almost there. Um, let me show you what one city firm, Pantheon, thinks is going to happen to inflation, soaring up, peaking actually next month and then falling away through next year. And that's a lot of economists think that is what's going to happen because they see high petrol prices, high food, high gas as a one-off shock caused by the war in Ukraine and also the impact of COVID. And as that works its way through the system, then those prices should stop going up and therefore inflation should stop rising. It's worth bearing in mind, obviously, for households, prices will still be at a very high level. They just won't be going up anymore. So how likely is it that this will happen? Well, the price of gas on international markets is going to be one key influence on that. Another new uncertainty is what happens to how the government here protects households from those rising energy prices. At the moment, of course, there's an energy price freeze, which was going to last for two years. The government's now decided it's going to end next April, and we don't know how they're going to replace it then. But I can show you what that might mean for inflation actually going up again next April, up to about 11% before falling away. And that will be if the new mechanism the government adopts in any way means that household bills feel the full impact of rising gas and electricity prices.